Well, greetings and a most heartfelt salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the old mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. And how do you get a question to us? It's simple. Just email a question to us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Email them all in. We take mailbag questions Monday through Friday at Movie Talk. Then Josh and I take a whole bunch of them here on the weekends. So send them on in. I take them for my Twitter and my Facebook as well. Just send us some questions and maybe we'll get them on the show. And I'm, of course, joined today by the aforementioned Mr. Josh McCuga. Thanks, John. I, I'm shocked you didn't mention your personal email out there, which is canadianstuds69 <laughs> at gmail.com. You can throw it in there. <laughs> I just get too much spam if I, if I put it out. And by the way, you know, earlier this week, uh, big congrats to you. Your Thank Pittsburgh you, Penguins defeated yeah. the Washington Capitals again. Uh, again, <laughs> yep. Uh, nine and one there. I heard a stat this morning, which I didn't even know. We are seven and zero oh in game sevens on the road. I did not know that. No idea. That's yeah. a pretty good. Uh, that's know. pretty good. Set. All but right. I think what the fans want to know, John. Yes. Your Canadian man. Yeah. Will you be rooting for my Penguins and Sidney Crosby, the uh, greatest hero in the history of Canada, <laughs> or will you be rooting for the Ottawa Senators? Uh, I'm actually going to be rooting for the Penguins. Yes. They, they are my second yes. favorite team. They've been one of my favorite teams ever since back in the days of Mario Lemieux, and of course, Sid the Kid uh, grew up where I grew up. And uh, or at least grew up, was born where I was born, and so uh, my Canadian connection is with Sydney. So there strong, we go. I like the answer. All right, let's get going now with the mailbag question. We're starting today off with question number one from Leanne Maiden, who writes. Hey guys, I love the show and I watch all of your content every day. You guys are nothing less than amazing and I appreciate all the work you do. Well, thank you so much, Leanne. My question is this. It seems that recently we have seen an influx into the kinds of content that is adapted from books or novels. Things like Game of Thrones, American Gods, 13 Reasons Why, Big Little Lies, and so on. I'm interested in knowing how does a studio determine which books it will adapt? How do they determine how much influence the original creators have on the work when it's translated to the screen? And what are some of your picks for a movie or a story that you would love to see on the big or small screen? Um, well, I'll start with the last part of your question. I've been saying this one for a while. I, I've often been asked over the years, a novel I, I think would do great as a movie adaptation, and that is Shogun. Now, they wow. turned by James Clavell. They turned it into a television miniseries, which was great, I think back in the 80s mm -hmm. or something like that. But the story is amazing going into feudal Japan and stuff like that. Great it's just stuff. incredible. It would make a fantastic movie. So that's my part on that. What was was Shogun the, also a video game? That was like an old NES game, wasn't well, it? Well, I don't think it was had anything to do with the with the, with with the, the book. Okay. No, 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 no. 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 Uh, for me, um, I, it's simple. There's a book called Bound by Honor. Uh, it's about Bill Bonanno, who is Joe Bonanno's son, who is the, one of the uh, Joe Bonanno was one of the first uh, original crime mafia bosses in New York, one of the first five families. And his son, Bill, uh, was in the mob and got out and wrote a book about it. And some of his stories are unbelievable. I don't know how you make that into a movie, but it would almost be like a good fellow. It's pretty impressive. Now, as far as the question about like, how do like either studios or networks determine which novels they'll adapt? I mean, it's, they just look at the story and say, will this lend itself well to a big screen adaptation? Sure. The first thing they'll ask, is it psychotically popular? Like a Harry Potter franchise or something like a gone girl or a uh, yep. girl on the train. Or so, the Dragon Tattoo. So you get from like psychotically popular like Lord of the Rings or like Harry Potter. Then yeah. it almost doesn't matter if it will adapt well or not. They'll probably do it. But the other thing is, but there are you know millions of books out there. They look, what will adapt well? So you read a Gone Girl book. It's like, no, this can translate into a beautiful, wonderful movie. 100%. Um, it's, the, the jury's still out on American Gods. I mean, they're off to a strong start. We'll see how that one actually pans yeah. out. Now, as far as how much control the creator will have over the property, most of the times, the studios would like the creators to have no control over the property whatsoever. <laughs> now, in a case of Fifty Shades or in a case like Harry Potter, where those are psychotically popular and every studio knows that every other studio is trying to get the rights, yeah. and the creator says, I want creative control, eh, then they're going to bend yeah. a little bit. But for the most part, they don't want them to have any kind of control. Somebody like uh, Stephanie Meyer in Twilight, same kind of a thing. Right, yeah. She was shopping that around town. She was getting crazy numbers. And th the only studio that was like, yeah, we'll let you have creative control was the one she went with. And for the most part, and I think we've seen this, I mean, other than the Harry Potter franchise, I think we've seen that the novelist should not have any control yeah. over the movie because they're good at writing books. <laughs> they're not good at making movies or TV shows. Leave yep. that to the people who make TV shows. And movies, but it's it's different. The long, the short answer is, 
it really depends on a case by case basis. Yeah. How popular is the franchise? How well will it adapt? How influential is the author at that point? Um, and then you know you had something like um, oh who's the one the, the the name of the lady who wrote the Harry Potter franchise? Uh, J.K. Rowling. Yeah, Rowling. Like she already has all the money in the world. <laughs> all of it. Legitimately. She has like literally all of it. The money in your pocket borrowed it's hers the queen has to venmo jk rowling let's just <laughs> yes say that. she yeah. has all the money in the world so she has all the control and all the power whereas another author is like two million dollars yeah. i never thought in my life i'd see two million dollars and like they give so it's really a case-by-case -case basis yeah. all right let's move on to the next question the next question comes to us from gerardo yepes who writes if Kylo Ren was only just beginning his training at the end of Episode 7, how did he successfully raid Luke's Jedi Temple? I don't think Snoke would ever risk himself doing that, and Kylo, even with the help of the Knights of Ren against Luke and his Jedi... Nope, not buying it either. I tend to think that there was another before Kylo. Definitely a Force user who could match Luke. Maybe Benicio Del Toro's character. What does the Council think? Well, as one of the members of the Jedi Council... I am just a guy. <laughs> I can point... The, the, first, the problem with the question is this, and there's, a, there's an error in your question. You're asking if Kylo's just beginning his training at the end of Episode 7. You misinterpreted what Snoke said. He did not say, I need to begin... Kylo's training, I need to complete his training. His training was not complete. So there's a huge difference to that. So when Snoke at the end of The Force Awakens says, get Kylo Ren and bring him to me, I need to complete his training. He just says, uh, bring Kylo to me. It's time to begin his training. Right. Because if that kid had never begun training, he'd be the most powerful Jedi the universe <laughs> had ever seen, considering he's already stopping blaster bolts and all that kind of crap. Um, so yeah, I, so the question is a little bit flawed right there, but it's funny I bring it up because this isn't the first time somebody asked me something like that. It's mm -hmm. like, how did Kylo just begin his training at the end of the Force Awakens? The all answer is wording. that yeah, it's all in the wording. That's a mis misunderstanding. He did not begin his training. He was being sent to complete his, what I can only assume, his dark side training at that point. It's sort of like, I feel like Luke in Empire, when or it, it, you know, he's, he's on Dagobah and... Uh, you know, he's he's working with Yoda. It's part of the training as it goes on. Obi-Wan led him to Yoda. And then obviously in, in Return of the Jedi, we're at some place where Luke has almost finished his training almost or completely finished it. I, but with Kylo, I never thought that it was like he begins his training. It was more like you have come this far, but you, can only, you can't go farther yet because I still need to finish your yeah. training. Yeah. All right. We move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Jared, who writes... Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. I was just wondering your thoughts on a possible Warcraft sequel. What are the odds, and would you even want to see one? Did you even get out to see the... I did. What did you think? Uh, you know, I know you were a big WoW guy back in the day. Huge World of Warcraft <laughs> fan, yeah. These stories are of legend, uh, the, what you would do uh, playing WoW. I was never a fan, so I went in this kind of a, a little bit skeptical, just based on the trailer and all the motion capture and everything. I thought it was actually a pretty good movie. Personally, I don't really... It's not like on my radar, like, man, I can't wait to see another World of Warcraft. It did okay. Critically, it was liked. It wasn't like, oh my God, we need to see another World of Warcraft. I don't see it happening in the very near future at all. What do you think? I was actually a fan of the Warcraft movie. You know okay. what? I'm going to bring up, uh, I need to get the final box office numbers here. Uh, Based Warcraft on production with all that mocap, you have to imagine that. It was, but I believe it ended up being a little bit profitable. It was. It actually made $433 million worldwide. Yeah. But it only made $47 million North America. Right, that's now, really tough. So overall, it made $433 million. That does push it into the profitable category because the the production budget was 160 So you're probably looking at needing to make about 390 400 to break even. So at $433 million worldwide, it definitely was a profitable mo movie for the studio into the, into the tens of millions of dollars. So it was profitable. It was not warmly received by, it wasn't super warmly received by audiences and certainly wasn't warmly received by the critics. I enjoyed the movie. It To me, I had a little bit of the same sense of the first time I watched Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, because I grew up reading The Hobbit and the, the Lord of the Rings novels. And when I watched that first movie, oh man. I was like, I feel like they have taken me to the Shire. Like, I just remember that. That yeah. movie blew my mind. Oh, yeah. And overall, it's just I super saw that movie, movie four times in the theater. Yep. Nominated, I love that movie. Nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. Actually, only two trilogies. 
have ever had all three films in their trilogy nominated for Best Picture? Can you name the two trilogies? Godfather? The Godfather. And I'm guessing... No, because Two Towers didn't get nominated. Two Towers did get nominated did for Best really? Picture. So the Godfather trilogy and the Lord, Lord of the, the Rings, Rings trilogy, wow. all, but wow. all three, Godfather 1 and 2 won Best Picture. Mm-hmm. The third Lord of the Rings film won Best Picture. So anyway, there you Pretty go. Pretty impressive. So when I watched Warcraft... As somebody who played a hell of a lot of <laughs> Warcraft, Warcraft 2, World of Warcraft, Warcraft 3, I played them all. I it, it did the same thing to me. I felt like, oh my God, I'm in Azeroth. Okay. Like I, I really felt like I was I was taken there. And that is a huge thing for like connecting to the nostalgia factor. Right on. I thought some of the action was great. I thought the design of the orcs was wonderful. I like the orc, the orc uh sociology, if yeah, you will, yeah, at yeah, that yeah. point. But look, it absolutely was not the movie I hoped it would be. It certainly didn't become the video game movie that was going to f- crack open the floodgates yeah. and let video game movies enter into a new golden era. It wasn't that at all. But I believe there was enough people that liked it. And because it was profitable, I think it might do even better next time. I think we are going to get one. Okay. I think we are going to get one. Where and would I do you want see one. it? 2019, 2020? Probably 2020. Okay. I'm going to guess 2020 at this point. All right. uh, Let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Arnazin Ilo, who writes, Hey, guys. Longtime fan of the show since AMC. Just a tech enthusiast. Oh, great. (laughs) I would like to know why you guys think most movies are not shooting entirely with IMAX cameras. We've had movies with some scenes in IMAX, but Infinity War will be the first to shoot entirely with IMAX cameras. Isn't this just the next evolution in the tech in the technical arena of filmmaking, much like we thought 3D was going to be? Yeah. I mean, you might be better suited to talk about this because you, you are a visual effects guy and you know a lot about all that kind of stuff. But for me, I would imagine the cost of shooting on the IMAX cameras is so much so that it may detract from actually putting it in a non-IMAX theater, thus almost making it kind of a moot point. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Like, uh, I think a lot of moviegoers are like, it's $22 for IMAX. I could still just go see it in HD and it still feel the same to me. Yeah. Uh, okay, historically, one of the big reasons why like it was a real pain in the ass to shoot with IMAX cameras because one camera is not like another. So you can get a camera this this big, but IMAX cameras were like the size of your pickup truck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for a while. Yeah. I mean, if you ever watch some behind the scenes footage of like The Dark Knight, when Christopher Nolan shot some scenes in IMAX, and you look at the behind the scenes footage of him trying to work with an IMAX That's camera, crazy. It was a pain in the ass, and it was incredibly expensive. And the you film had you had to film. use, I mean, yeah, my God, the film you had to use at the time was ridiculous. So. It was just very cost prohibitive, but also effort inhibitive at the same time. Now, the other problem is the only time you can really take advantage of seeing something in IMAX is if it's on an IMAX screen. And there are only a finite number of IMAX screens in the country. So therefore, the the um, demand, if you will, for IMAX content is has a hard ceiling. It has a limit to how much demand there is because there's only so many IMAX screens. Now, times, they are a change in. (laughs) Um, like IMAX and this camera company called Ari, um, A-R-R-I for any of you who are interested, they have recently started developing new digital IMAX cameras that are smaller than their predecessors have been. Still large, but small. Large. Still large. And there are still film, I believe there are only 24 film IMAX cameras in the world. I, I think there are only four of them in existence. Jesus. Or sorry, 24 of them in existence, okay. right? Um, now these digital ones that they're now starting to create, which do the full resolution of IMAX. Uh, they are significantly smaller. They're still tougher to use, and they're still incredibly expensive, but they're a hell of a lot easier to use now. The reason that they could shoot you know, uh, the new Avengers film in IMAX is because... And in Humans, uh, which is coming out on IMAX and then on ABC. Are they shooting that in IMAX? The first two episodes are going to be... Uh, premiered for two weeks on IMAX, IMAX screens, screens and then goes to TV. Oh, so, well, there you go. Yeah. The reason they can do that is because Ari and IMAX have made these advancements to shrink them up. So this might lead to more people using them. But again, there's a question of why use them. Like, because they can only really be taken advantage of on IMAX screens. Yeah. IMAX screens represent a small percentage of the amount of overall film screens out there. But as that gap between how big, 
how useful and how expensive it is to use a regular camera that the average film filmmaker would use or an IMAX camera. As that difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller, I think you're probably going to see an awful lot more films start using IMAX to shoot. It was sort of like Laserdisc back in the day, right? Yeah. It just kind of kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller until that, like, you know, the disc made sense and the player made sense and it was an economies of scale. Because, you know, Laserdisc was supposed to be this giant thing and then Laserdisc was around for like a week. But people bought into it. And I think a lot of people are just very weird of the cost of IMAX and how much it does cost to shoot and how much it does cost to even get that camera working that, uh, you know, again, like you said, it, it, it's hard for it to make sense for a lot of projects. Like you're not going to shoot a comedy on IMAX. No, but I remember, this is one of my earliest memories, as a little, little kid, I remember my mom and dad renting, I mean, I, must, I was super young, but renting a Laserdisc player. Yeah. And I remember the two movies they rented. Here they are. I guarantee 99% of you have not seen either of these two movies. One is the Mr. T classic, DC Cab. Um, it's, 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 I haven't seen that movie in so long. So, but you have seen I've it. I've seen but that movie. But the publisher is like, Mr. T is actually a small character, but the poster is just Mr. Oh, T, Mr. T. On, yeah. on the cover, right? Because he was very popular at yeah. the time. Um, the other one, was the Dan Aykroyd classic. See if you can guess which one it is. Just by the fact that it's Dan Aykroyd. Spies Like Us? Nope. Dr. Detroit. <laughs> Dr. Detroit. <laughs> Dr. Detroit. Those I, Now, why my mom and dad uh, rented DC Cab and Dr. Detroit? Those might have been the only two titles available. <laughs> I guess I don't know, but that was that uh, was my experience. Incredible, with maybe because Detroit was like a close city to where you were in Canada. I, maybe. I think it was just that it was it was Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> the the cover was kind of fun. It was him in like, I think it was like a yellow suit swing yes, on something. Yes. Uh, whatever. Wait, real quick. This is a total aside. My buddy right. introduced me to Red Green yesterday. The Canadian. I'm shocked that you didn't know about Red Green. No seems like your kind of character. I watched like 20 clips of Red Green yesterday. If you're out there and you want to see some amazing comedy, Red Green, unbelievable. He was hysterical. Red Green is a Canadian treasure. Yes. You got to look it up. And his his biggest saying, his big closing quote is always, <laughs> remember, fellas, if the ladies can't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. <laughs> and that's Red Green. He's got a great book on duct tape. Does he really? He's got, yeah, the Red Green Book of Duct Tape. Oh, my you should, God. You should look Incredible. it up. It's, yeah. it's amazing. I like that his other sign-off was like, uh, tell the boys at the Elks Club I'll be late, and uh, boys, keep your sticks on the ice. Yep, like <laughs> keep your sticks on the ice. All right, <laughs> let's move on. The next question today comes to us from DJ Kentner, who writes, any updates on the New York City Comic Con plans? Yeah, um, we... As a, as a, officially as a crew, we've never gone to New York Comic Con. Yeah, no. I mean, Schnepp has definitely gone there last year, and he's, he's been there before. Our, we are looking at taking the full crew, or close to the full crew, or like more than the full crew, <laughs> to New York City Comic Con this year. We have massive, massive plans. We just aren't 100% sure which plans we're going to be able to fully enact or not. So there's really not much more to, that we can say about okay. it, other than... It, look, and why haven't we done New York City Comic Con in the past? There's no slight on New York City Comic Con. But San Diego Comic Con, which is is bigger, is an hour and a half or two hour drive <laughs> from here. It's not a big deal. Yeah. New York means having to get everybody flying us all across the country, putting Hotels. us up. In, it's, yeah. it's a very expensive endeavor, and that's why we haven't really done it on any sort of scale in years past. Yeah. But we do have some plans coming together. Have you ever been to New York City Comic Con? I have never been to New York City Comic Con. Uh, I, I know last year was their biggest one yet, and hence the reason we're all talking about it and excited about going to New York City Comic Con. I know it's easier to find a hotel room at New York City Comic Con. That's for It sure. is. It is much easier. <laughs> Dear heavens. Yes. Okay, can I just say this again? Go. San Diego Comic-Con needs to move to Las Vegas. It just, it has to. This I think if they moved it to May and put it in Vegas, or early June, if you're doing July in Vegas, that's too hot. When are you outside? Well, I'm just saying. I mean, if, but when are you, when I'm in Vegas, I ain't going to Vegas to hang out outside. Well, I'm going to Vegas to hang out in the resort, and the convention center, in whatever. You're Listen, you're 100% right, but that Vegas convention center is a little far off the strip. It's not... It's not right next to yeah, it. The shuttles take you right there. You are there are tons of hotels. You listen. Vegas is just hot. I'm telling you, it is. San Diego is hot enough. But you throw. Listen, I'm I'm not disagreeing with you because I think in Vegas they would absolutely destroy that. That convention center is gigantic. There's so much hotel space. There is so much more to do. The parties would be out 
outrageous. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just think they, if they moved it to May, I'd be a lot happier than if it was in July. Because here's the thing. Like, with we just had the hotel situation for Comic Con is unreasonably stupid. Yep. All right. We just had, first of all, you can't just book a hotel. You have to go into a lottery. All right. <laughs> we got like 12 of us yep. in the office at eight o'clock in the morning on the day the lottery was opening so we could all submit for hotel rooms. Out of the 12 of us, two. two, two, just two, you and Adam and Adam, that's it. Two out of the 12 yeah. were, we say, okay, yeah, we can give you rooms. 10 of us couldn't. Yeah. I mean, it is ridiculous. Whereas Las Vegas, they have a show that's twice as big as Comic-Con. It's called CES, the Consumer Electronics yeah. Show. Twice as many people go to that as go to Comic-Con. I've been in Las Vegas during CES. It's madness. That town doesn't blink. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing but hotel rooms. It's got five million hotel rooms within five feet of walking. I mean, it's just, it's, you got to move this thing because it's getting unreasonable <laughs> in San Diego. And I love Comic-Con. Okay, anyway, how do we get on that? Oh, uh, New York Comic-Con we're Comic -Con. talking about. All right, the next question comes to us from Jonathan Stubbs who writes, Will Han Solo's May release date affect its marketing and possibly contradict the last jedi marketing no nah, it's the last away. jedi comes out in december how so coming out in may that's five months away yeah you you almost you almost literally cannot get further away <laughs> than than Wait, what I mean. five months in movie time is an eternity. Yes. You're like, you yes, forget about... I mean, what? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was was last weekend. In three weeks, you're going to forget that it was in theaters when it was when it was in theaters. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it, the movie, especially with the blockbusters, the turnover is so much so that every weekend, your brain is just being washed and then repurposed into another movie. Yeah. I mean, like, it's five months away yeah, from yes. it. I yeah. mean, let's put this perspective. The Last Jedi will have been out on Blu-ray for almost two months by the time yeah. Han Solo comes out. Out. So no, no worries about it at all. It's perfectly Winter's fine. Winter's past. Spring is almost finished. You're into summer for Christ's sake. Yeah, we're perfectly fine. Yeah. All right. James David uh, Saddle writes, Star Blazers or Space Battleship Yamato, any news? I've heard nothing. I, I've I've heard nothing more. And my God, do I want that movie. I feel like that's an Emma Fife question. She knows so much about all of that kind of stuff. Uh, she is an anime, animation, all that kind of, she is a, a master of all of that. I don't know much about it, so I'm just, I'm siding with you on this one, John. Yeah, Star Blazers is my all-time favorite anime. Probably. Is it really? It is. I, I used to love that. I still, as an adult, I can watch episodes of it wow. today. Okay. Now, I know there was, uh, I think Japan, there was a Japanese live-action version of it was highly questionable. Okay. Um, I mean, they did some really cool work, works with the effects, but all it really did was make me even more hungry to see a, a North American version of it. Uh, so I am dying to see a Space Battleship Yamato, awesome. a.k.a. Maybe they call it Space Battleship Midway yeah. instead, or just, just call it Star Blazers and everybody will be fine. <laughs> I am dying to see that movie, but awesome. I have not heard. I mean, we heard some news about... Could you describe it to me in like 30 seconds? Okay, so basically speaking... The Earth starts getting attacked by this unknown alien race. And the way they're attacking is by sending these radioactive asteroids that just slam into the Earth that slowly starts to poison the Earth with radio, uh, radiation. Okay. Mankind then moves further and further underground, but they've gone as deep as they can go, and they have one year until the radiation poisoning seeps down to where they are. What? So, then mankind gets this mysterious message from this princess somewhere out in the galaxy that says i have a device that will clean your world the trick is you've got to get to me and get back within one year whoa so what they do is the scientists they go and unearth the old battleship yamato the old world war ii battleship okay and they retrofit it into a space battleship so you have this Sounds incredible. that flies into space and they have to fight their way through this aggressive it. alien race all the way there, get at the thing and get back in time. That sounds incredible. How has that not been a movie? It I almost sounds like a trilogy. No, this is a, this could be a trilogy. Yeah. Just getting there could be one movie, getting halfway back, getting back could be the second movie and then the final finishing war. off the war. Now in the TV show, the war finishes off before they get back to Earth and that's all fine, but you can change things, I'm telling I you. I love it. That sounds Sorry, incredible. Spending too much time on no. this. I'm very passionate about <laughs> Star Blazers. 
All right. Um, you just rip off your shirt and you have Star Blazer tattooed across your chest. <laughs> Jesus, Campia. Uh, next question comes from Jared Nicholas. What movie are you looking forward to the most this year, other than Star Wars, of course? Uh, what's funny, earlier this week we talked about the big blockbusters coming out in the summer. Yeah. Um, look, I'm very, very excited about Dunkirk. I was just going to say, that last trailer for Dunkirk blew my mind. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. That movie's going to be great. Yep. I can't wait for it. I'm very excited about Baby Driver, the new Edgar Wright film. Yeah. Uh, Lucky the Lucky Logans, yeah, uh, I believe looks incredible. Um, obviously, super excited about uh, you know uh, Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, I'm very excited fun. about. I, I'm probably most looking forward to Wonder Woman. Yeah, at this point, I mean Wonder Woman. I think is going to be the movie of the summer. It's going to be what everybody's going to be talking about, especially going into Comic Con. People are still going to be going to see it. Uh, for me, weirdly enough, and it comes out in two weeks, is Rough Night. I know that movie looks stupid, but that last Red Band trailer really made me giggle. And uh, I, it's something about girls doing like I loved Bridesmaids. I loved oh, Bridesmaids that was movie. So good. I'm hoping that this is like Bridesmaids. It almost looks like a Bridesmaids meets um, uh, uh, Weekend at Bernie's. You know, something just so silly. It really intrigues me because I love all the cast. I'm you rarely see Scarlett Johan Johansson in a comedy. Uh, uh, the girl from Workaholics. Um, Jillian Bell. Yeah, yeah. And the girl from Broad City. I mean, it's a really good cast. And of course, Kate McKinnon. Kate Australia, McKinnon's in Australian there well. accent. Yeah. yeah. So, rough night. Uh, here's the funny thing. I mentioned this on Movie Talk the other day. It's, this is one of those rare situations. Because quite often I'll say, you know, I bet this movie's going to be awesome, but the trailers have not worked for me. Yeah. But that's okay. The trailers have been bad, but I still think the movie's going to be awesome. This movie, Rough Night, is a very, very rare opposite thing of that. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling this movie isn't going to be any good. Yeah. Okay. The trailers are awesome. I have really liked the trailers. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm very curious to see how that movie turns out. All right. All right. The next question comes to us from Tyler Adams, who writes, wasn't there supposed to be another South Park movie made by now? I mean, I thought that was part of the deal of Interstellar getting moved over. <laughs> You are remembering that correctly. Actually, there were a couple yeah. of properties in play there. You remember Warner Brothers wanted to stay in the Christopher Nolan business. So some studios traded some rights. Interstellar could go here, whatever. And then I believe a Friday the 13th yeah. uh, franchise was part of that deal. And South Park. Okay. Now, just because a studio, though, acquires the rights to make a movie doesn't mean that means they have plans to make the movie. Yeah. Maybe they say, hey, we'll get it. Maybe someday we'll do it. But that doesn't mean, oh, we got the rights to the movie. That means we're start rolling the cameras. We're going to make a movie. No, I mean, lots of titles are owned by studios that will never see the light of day. I do think we're going to see another South Park movie at some point. But here's the uh, thing. Not until the show ends, at least. We weirdly enough, have some insider stories from a lot of South Park. A buddy of mine worked with Ooh. them for eight years. What can you tell us? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to break it down. Uh, they were very, very disappointed with the movie making process. Uh, they were exhausted after Team America World Police. Oh, they hated it. Hated it. Hated, 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 hated movie. it. Uh, they, were, they were obviously a fan of making Bigger, Longer, Uncut. Basketball, I still think, is an underrated comedy. Weird, very, very weird movie, but fun. They are just totally soured on the movie making process. And when South Park goes into production, they are in production for all of 15 to 16 weeks. I mean, they make the show the week of, they animate it, they write it because they want it to be as topical as possible, and then they are done for the year. The guys are just, they are rolling in money, and they don't need to make a, a South Park movie. If anything, when the series ends, if it ever does end, because, I mean, Comedy Central would be dumb to end it because that is their flagship, and that will mm -hmm. always be their flagship. Uh, maybe they'll make, like, a series-ending movie where the kids are grown up or something like that. I don't know, but you, I don't think you'll see a movie again for a long time. I think I, I remember I was so pleasantly surprised by Stick of Destiny. Yeah. <laughs> did you play? Did you play that game or at least watch any of the the game? No, but I just heard so many people say that word. It makes me laugh. It's so funny. Okay, it's that game is hilarious. Yeah. I, if you have not played, and now they've got a new game coming out. Really? Based instead because Stick of Destiny was basically. Uh, based on off of uh, Game of Thrones kind of stuff. And yeah. that series of episodes they had that were Game of Thrones centric. Amazing. So they built a game around that. Now they have a game coming out that still sells all the South Park guys, but movie franchises. Awesome. Uh, superhero movie franchises. That's so good. Uh, and I cannot remember the name. Well, Cartman plays the coon. Yes. His character. What's that? Fractured Butthole. Fractured Butthole. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, and if that's as good and as big of a hit, I mean, we'll see. But you're yeah, right. That, the biggest thing to keep in mind about why there isn't another one is that the South Park guys, the South Park guys, 
really don't like making movies. And that's why we really haven't seen a Book of Mormon movie yet. All right, last question of the day. And this one comes from Paul Reaper, who writes, Where do you see the MCU in five years? I mean, do you think that Chris Evans, Robert Downey Jr., and Chris Hemsworth are still a part of it in five years? No. I definitely don't think Robert Downey Jr. is a part of it in five years. Uh, Chris Evans, maybe. But man, he really keeps trying to, you know, get like an indie film off the ground or something like that. I, it's it's weird to think where it will be because that'll be after Infinity War two, sort of almost like almost like a a bookend to the entire franchise and who leads it going forward, who takes it over. There's enough Marvel characters, there's just not enough that are as well known as an Iron Man or a Captain America or a Thor or you know the Avengers. It's that's a really really tricky question that, that uh, you, you got to imagine that that Marvel has something in place. Disney has some sort of plan in place, right? You, you think, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. I think all three of those names are still involved in the MCU come five years from now. Okay. Now, I, I, that's not to say that I don't think one of them might take a two-year break or whatever, sure. but it, it all comes down to this. Actors love success. <laughs> Actors. Everybody loves yeah. success. Who doesn't love a good now, success story? And I go back to this. Remember, Robert Downey Jr.'s contract was running out. It was going to expire. Mm-hmm. And there was that whole thing. I mean, it was practically a daily topic on Movie Talk for a while about what's he going to do? Where's what's going to go? happen now? Robert Downey Jr. is going to leave and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And then what was it called? The Judge. The Judge happened mm-hmm. where Robert Downey Jr. got his first taste in a while, in a while, his first taste of him making his own moves without that Marvel company, yep. right? And it was terrible. That lemonade had no sugar. No sugar at all. Mm -mm. That did not work out so well. And all of a sudden, talks between Robert Downey Jr. and Marvel heated up again. And he signed a new multi-film deal. He's not surfing in Malibu. He's back at the uh, studio making movies. Yes, he is. And and I think we're all very happy that he did because that dude was born to play Tony Stark. 100%. Chris Hemsworth now. Let's take a look at Chris Hemsworth. He did a very, very good movie called Rush. I thought it was fantastic. It was a wonderful movie. Yeah. Did not do so well. No. Then he gets the big leading role in this this, this kind of a espionage tech world thing, Black Hat. Going to be a big hit, right? Goo. Bomb. <laughs> and it bombs. What was that movie? It came out the same time as that movie with Johnny Depp with like when he was the face. Oh, that's right. I think it was Deacons who directed that. Yeah. I, I think it was Deacons uh, where that he's movie like, called? he gets taken and he becomes the computer program yes. or something like oh, that. They both came out the same time. And that was almost almost as bad Ooh, as Black Hat was. Yeah. was. Frequency. Uh, was that, that the it? name of it? No, no. Frequency is the name frequency? of the. No, that's the one where the guy t- talks to his son in the past or in oh, the that's right. through the radio. Transcendence. Thank you, Thanks, fact Jonathan. checker Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> Transcendence is what did that. Um, and then he got a, a kind of co-starring role in that National Lampoon's Family Vacation Tour, whatever the name of it oh, was. Oh, yeah, that was brutal. That did not get well received. Nope. Did not work out so well. Okay, so now, you, so I, I guess what? I don't think he's going to go anywhere. No. Then let's look at Chris Evans. You point out yourself. Like, he's tried to get these smaller things going, and he's done some good stuff, but... Yeah. Nothing that has caught on to any commercial appeal. Yep. And I think what's going to happen is, is Marvel and Disney know people love seeing these actors in these roles. These actors are going to figure out our audience loves seeing us in these roles. And they just need to adapt a George Clooney philosophy. George Clooney's philosophy with the movies he makes is simple. It's one for them, one for me. Talking about his audience. Yes. I make one movie that's for them. Ocean's 12. One movie that's for me. American. Uh, Yeah. Then one for them, one for me, one for them. And I think if these guys adapted, and it sounds like like Chris Hemsworth seems to have that kind of philosophy right mm-hmm. now, but he's realizing the for them stuff is not working out so well. Or yeah. sorry, the for him stuff is not working out so well. Um, I think that you need to adapt that philosophy. So Robert, you want to make other movies, Robert Downey Jr. That's cool. Don't make a Marvel film every single year. Just have every other year you do Marvel film and keep another year where you can focus on a, a passion project that's yours and you do. But it just seems like it's best for the studio to keep them around. It seems like it's best for them to stay around. Agreed. No, I think uh, all the points you're making are very, very on point. (laughs) No pun intended. Uh, I think that you're silly to 
punch that gift horse in the mouth. I still have no idea what that saying means. But you, <laughs> you, the, you. First of all, the phrase is not punch a gift horse in the mouth. It's, it's look the gift horse. Ah, uh, look mouth. the gift gift horse in the mouth. My bad on that. One. <laughs> in my world, it's punch the damn gift horse. Uh, but you know, we we know Thor is one person. We know Iron Man is one person. Don't ride hump, the wave. Don't hump that gift horse in the mouth. Don't hump That's it. Wise words, kids. <laughs> yeah, they got meal tickets. I mean, keep on them. Exactly. All right, guys, that'll do it for us today. That's all of our time for now. But don't fret. We will be back again tomorrow for our Sunday edition of Mailbag. You guys can join us then. I want to thank my co-host today, Mr. Josh Makuga. Josh, where can people find you online? At Josh Makuga on Twitter and Instagram. Collider TV Talk every Monday, and the Josh Makuga Show on YouTube. And you can find me humping gift horses in the mouth on <laughs> Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia special thanks to Jonathan behind the camera and thanks to you guys for joining us don't forget subscribe to this YouTube channel keep you up to date on everything we got going on here at Collider Video and don't forget as well our show Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns new episodes air every Friday on the Verizon Go 90 network check that out so for all of us here in the studio thank you guys for joining us and until next time bye bye